Without further ado, I'm going to introduce Sally Diane, who's the fabulous clairvoyant I've been lucky enough to get at the store to do readings, and now she's going to do a series of workshops as well as talk tonight. She's going to give us a little bit of fascinating new facts about the tarot, so I'd like to have everyone welcome Sally Diane. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, every, I'm sure, has everybody heard of the tarot? Everybody knows what it is. Okay. Now, I want to uh, start out just diving right in. I'll talk to you a little later on in the lecture about my own personal experience. But I want to talk about some of my early influences. And I want to start with Eden Gray. And uh, this is a quote from Mastering the Tarot which was the uh, first book on the tarot I got with my first deck. And she says, give those to, for whom you read encouragement to strive for their highest ideals. The seeds you plant can blossom into lovely seeds of accomplishment. And, you know, I'm really glad that she was my first influence because she was really positive and gentle. And she helped me to see the tarot as a positive and gentle uh, tool to use for reading. Now, Eden Gray herself was born in 1901 in Chicago. She was actually born Priscilla Partridge, which is that a fabulous name, and her family owned the Garrett Theater. And she became interested in the Garrett Theater, which didn't please her father, who uh, snatched her from the headlights, and those are her words, um, and made her work a, a shopkeeper job at a department store. So when she was 19, she ran off to, to New York and got married to a uh, novelist and screenwriter named Lester Cohen. And they traveled around a lot. They got to see the world. And, you know, that kind of opens up your horizon. So when she came back to New York, she was ready to learn a little bit more about the myst mystic world. And that's when she met a librarian by the name of Gertrude Moakley. And Gertrude Moakley had been studying the origins of the tarot uh, in the Renaissance in Italy. She'd, been, she'd just come back from Italy. And she got uh, Eden interested in the tarot. And Eden ran a bookstore that was one of the few places in the United States where you could learn, the, where you could buy a tarot deck and where you could learn about the tarot. And she self-published her first book on the tarot in 1960. And then back in um, <clears throat> 1970 with the hippies and the flower children. I don't know how many of, of us there are out there, but I'm certainly one. <laughs> and uh, we, we were interested in something a little bit different. You know, the uh, standard male-dominated church was just a little bit too misogynist for us. And so we like to turn to things like the tarot. And tarot became very popular. And she's introduced two generations of novice readers to the tarot. And uh, one of the most important things that she brought to the table was a story called The Fool's Journey. And The Fool's Journey focuses on the major arcana. Now the tarot itself is 78 decks and split into two major groups. First you have the major arcana, which is a greater secret, key secrets, and then you have the minor arcana, which is called the lesser secrets. And the lesser secrets, we'll get to that a little bit later, but they're the pip cards. They're the sisters to our playing cards. Okay, but back to the major arcana and her fool's journey. It starts out with a fool, and you see that zero right on the top? Um, all the greater secrets have that, and that's called their key. And a little later on in the lecture, you'll see the Tree of Life. It has to do with the numbers of the path. There's 22 major arcana cards of 22 paths on the Tree of Life. I know you've all heard about how the Kabbalah is this new religion, and that's basically what's structured on as the Tree of Life. Anyhow, the Fool is, represents the soul. And in the fool's journey, the fool goes through three levels of transformation. He starts out with, um, he f the faces the challenges of life on a physical level. And that starts out with the magician. And the magician, as you can see, has everything in front, front of him. And the idea is that the magician has control of all the elements, so he's number one. 
And in the first level, the fool faces the basic physical challenges that we face in life. You know, he faces the, the mother, the father, the, the outer awareness, the inner awareness, society, adolescence, love, learning to get a handle on our emotions, all these things on a basic physical level. And that's what the first seven uh, cards talk about. And then in the fool's journey, the fool goes on to the social level. And that starts out with strength. And social level is how we deal with humanity in, in general. How we de deal with each other and the, and the people on the street, strangers, and our real, and our, that part of our world. And it starts out with strength. And uh, the concept behind strength, and we'll visit this card again. Um, it is that confidence. And on this level, fool masters his intellectual reality through confidence, introspection, tenacity, fairness, sacrifice, flexibility, flexibility, and conservation. And that's just words that kind of embody the challenges that the fool faces along the way as he goes through this middle level path. Now then we go to the spiritual and divine, and that starts out, I, I want to put these cards side by side because I'm just as uncomfortable with this card as anybody else here, but I wanted to remind everybody that the journey may start here, but it ends here. And in the fool's journey, the fool starts out and he's basically a prisoner to his fear, and his fear of the unknown, his fear through ignorance, and that's what the devil uses. And Remember that at the end of this journey, at the end of the spiritual journey, is the world where you have everything and you have perfect balance. And the world, just like the fool, is the only of the two cards that dances. So there's that idea of nirvana and perfection at the end of your spiritual journey. But it does start with the devil. It does start with overcoming fear and being willing to face the unknown. And could you switch to the next one? The next step is the tower, and the tower, even though it does look bad, there's, um, there's this idea that part of your journey is giving up what you don't need, and it's a reminder that what you don't need will be taken away from you. <clears throat> but it also, the next step, goes straight to hope. So it's that idea of rebirth, which is also part of the spiritual journey. Now, it gives you a story that helps you to understand the different levels of the fool's journey. And the major arcana itself is a very ancient, mystical um, a set of uh, mystical thought, a Western occult thought. And, um, it started out with these 22 cards. And these 22 cards were brought back into um, popular consciousness in the 20th century, not just by Eden Gray. Eden Gray was kind of the icing on the cake. Uh, it started out with a fellow named Sir Ed Arthur Edward Waite. And as you can tell by the looks of him, he was Victorian. He, was, he uh, was born in 1857 and lived to 1942. Now he was raised, uh, he, he was raised by a society mother, but they were raised in poverty. Basically they lived in the crappy suburbs of London. But she really struggled to get her son the best education she could. And it paid off. He was a prolific writer, he was a scholar, he was well, well respected both as a novelist and in the occult world. Um, after his sister died, and this was when he was in college, he left the Catholic Church, but the basic morals of the Catholic Church remained with him. So when he decided to write on the tarot, um, he wrote a book called The Key to the Tarot. And it wasn't until after he started writing the book they actually commissioned the artist, yeah. who was uh, Pamela Coleman Smith. And he knew Pamela Coleman Smith through the Golden Dawn. They both belonged to a, a society called the Golden Dawn, which went through a number of evolutions. And when I did the research for this lecture, I tried to follow all the evolutions of all the secret society in London that gave birth to these two decks of cards that you see over there. 
And you know, it was like following a soap opera. And somewhere along the line, one of the ladies that dropped out said that it was nothing but gray beards and widows. And I think that's pretty much well it. There were so many schisms and changes of leaderships and whatever, but um, Pamela Coleman Smith has belonged to the Order of Golden Dawn, and that's how Wade met her. But at the time he met her, she had already had a career as an artist. She already done quite a bit of traveling around. She started out in theater, too. She was in the Lyceum Theater in London when she was a young lass, and she worked with some people whose name, well, one person whose name you would recognize, Bram Stoker, Stoker. and he had the author of, author of Dracula. And of course, she was younger, and they used to call her Pixie. And you look at it, that name just fits. And she had this wonderful style of drawing that um, it, it was from an Oriental School of Art, from the Pratt Institute. And her style of drawing was uh, basically almost musical. Like the pictures that you've seen before were drawn by her. And they were pen and ink. And she did the all, she did 78 drawings in a six month period. And they were all just exquisite. And um, <clears throat> she was actually the one who illustrated Bram Stoker's last book, The, the Lair of the White Worm. And um, when she did the 78 pictures for the uh, tarot, she'd already been on display at a local gallery that was starting to get some renown. But this gallery was geared toward photographs. At the time she had her first display, it was, they were still trying to promote it. But after she had done the uh, 78 drawings, you know, it's, Wade took the drawings and put them in his book, The Key to the Tarot, but she still had the drawings that she wanted to put on display, but she never got the chance. And actually, in her lifetime, the book, the deck was never published, although the book, The uh, Key to the Tarot, was published in with, well, that was published in 1909. And then it was published again in 1911 to include Smith's line drawings. Um, now, it was published by a company called Ryder and Company. Now, when U.S. Games bought the rights to this in 1971, they published a deck, and they call it the Ryder Weight Deck, which is after the publisher and Sir Edward Weight. I want to give her most of the credit, and the reason is this. You remember I said 22 cards for the Major Arcana, okay? Now, what she brought to the table was the other 50, what do you say, 56, the other 56 cards, which were the Pip cards. And this was the first time that they had illustrations. Before that, it was just like the playing cards where you had the Ten of Swords was Ten Swords. And she was the one that designed that part of the deck. And she really didn't get credit for it. Well, I mean, you knew that it was Pamela Coleman Smith that did it. And she had a very unique little sigil at the, at the bottom that I'll point out to you. But, you know, first it was the Rider deck then in, in the 70s. And then it became the Rider Weight deck. And it hasn't been until lately that's been called the Wade Smith deck. And quite frankly, I almost think it should be called the Smith Wade deck. Anyhow, I'll get off my little. <laughs> yeah, and she lived like on her own terms. She was a suffragette. She, she worked uh, to bring the vote to the uh, women in London. And um, when she went through drawing the. the stuff for the tarot. She was also studying for Catholicism. And um, she basically joined the Catholic Church and dropped out of all of this. And the last that we know of her before her death was in 1918. She received a legacy from an uncle who had died in World War I and she used the money to buy a retreat for priests. The next thing you hear about her was at her death, and the most people have to say about her is that she died in penury and that her, her property had to be sold for, for her debts. And uh, I think she left a lot more than that, and I really wish I knew, know what happened between 1918 and the time she died, but I just don't. Um, 
one to go on to the second major influence, and it's another pair. And that would be first off, Alistair Crowley. Has anybody ever heard of Alistair Crowley? A few hands go up. And, and you know, he, everybody thinks he's the big demon. And uh, he really enjoyed that. <laughs> he was born in 1875, and he was born to a very wealthy family. His father had run a brewery, and the brewery was so successful that his father was able to retire and just live the life of Riley before he died. Now, he died when Alistair was 11, and uh, Alistair, he was a genius, and um, he liked attention, he liked to shock. His mother used to call him the Beast, and he loved being called the Beast. And I think that a lot of the stories about him were made up by him. <laughs> um, and he was part of this whole, this whole secret society paradigm where they, they're getting into their little politics. And he used to write these editorials, just scathing editorials, sometimes do it under pseudonym. But, you know, he liked to just throw out darts. And I think it was a credit to Sir Edward Wade that Crowley threw so many darts at him. He, he wrote one, one ed, uh, editorial about uh, what a stuffed shirt weight was, and he, the headline was, Wait, Wisdom While You Wait. And then the best one was, at one time, he wrote uh, Wait's Obituary. Wait was still alive at the time, and the headline read, Dead Wait. You can laugh, it was funny. <laughs> But um, one, of, one of many, many, many epiphanies he had was in 1904 on a trip to Egypt. And uh, his wife at the time, he, they were newly married, so it was kind of a romantic trip. And she was pregnant. And uh, I guess she got a little bit, well, it, hysterical was the word that was attached to it. So I'll just go with that. It was 1904, so we have a historic, hysterical pregnant woman. But she started having visions of the Egyptian gods. And she led Alistair to this Cairo Museum, to um, this one mausoleum exhibit. And the mausoleum exhibit had the number 666. And that just sold Alistair on the, on the study of Egypt, Egyptology. And uh, it led him to want to write the book of Toth which he didn't do until later on in life. He, he went on a lot of adventures. He didn't get around to doing that until 1937. And in 1937, he wanted to find an artist that he could work with the way the way he had worked with Pamela Coleman Smith to do the drawings for the, for the Toth. And um, at the time, I think he wanted to write the book of Toth, partly because for the first time in his life he was broke. And so he needed to, to write a successful book. And uh, he was meeting with these artists, and the two artists that were supposed to show up stood him up, but Lady Frida Harris was there. Now, Lady Frida Harris was, uh, she was the wife of a British politician. And looks are deceiving. She was really quite the party animal. I think that was a picture taken later on in, in life. And uh, here she had to live the life of, a, of the wife of a British politician. And so getting involved with Alistair Crowley just opened doors for her and adventures for her that she really wanted to take part in. At the time they met, she was studying art. She was studying something called, um, I want to make sure I get it right, projective synthetic geometry. And you can see that influence in her book. The idea was that there's certain shapes, a certain geometry that brings certain energies to you. And uh, she used that in the pictures. But that project took five years. There were so, as many as eight takes on some of these paintings. And she was probably the only person that Aleister Crowley got along with for his entire life. And there was. Uh, their, their relationship was totally platonic, probably, other than his mother, probably one of the only women in, in his life that he had a platonic relationship with. Um, and even after they finished the book, they stayed in touch. And it, it, she just, uh, he didn't live long after that. 
and he fell into ill health and she made sure that he was cared for. Um, at the time he died, she still had the paintings. The Book of Toth was printed, but the deck was not. And she intended to take the deck on tour in 1948, but for some reason that fell through. Um, the deck was, the Toth deck was not published until 1969. And by this time it was property of a temple that Crowley and Harris had helped to establish together called Ordo Templi Orientis. And uh, yeah, <laughs> I had to read it too. So anyhow, um, he, he'd left uh, control of the temple to Frida Harris because he knew that she wouldn't want the leadership. And so he thought that she would respect his wishes as far as choosing a leader, which I guess she did. Um, I know that they finally published the deck in 1969. And the deck that was published in 1969 was really not of good quality. The, the, not the, the reproduction of the paintings or anything. But the one thing that it did have was all the versions of the Magus card, the Magician card. Remember the number one key that I showed you earlier on in the lecture? That's the Magus card. And the 1969 publication had three Magus cards in it. Um, in 1977, they did another reprint where they did, they did just a beautiful deck this time, and a beautiful job at it. And then uh, the, the ones you see over there were from that run, from the 1977 run. In 1986, they did an update. And they've just recently done another one, and I know that's available in your store. And that particular one has all three of the matches cards in it again, if you want to see that. Now, I want to get around to the idea of the playing cards, which is the minor arcana. And the minor arcana, I said that the uh, it was a lot like our regular playing cards before Pamela Coleman Smith. And um, could you go to number 12, please? Oh, yes. Okay, the Ace of Spades became the Ace of Swords, and that's so to say with the element of air. And uh, that, and the, the diamonds became the pentacles. The wands became the, cl the clubs became the wands. And then the uh, cups became the heart. The hearts became the cups. And um, in my classes, I teach the students that that if you needed a quickie deck, once you know how to read the tarot, you know how to read playing cards, because the major arcana, the minor arcana, is the same as reading the playing cards. Like the the swords, the spades are associated with difficult emotional issues. You know, you think about swords, of course. Uh, the pentacles, the pentacles associated with money, sometimes they're called coins. The wands associated with fire, they're associated with uh, business and, and, and ideas and all, and all the things that inspire me, the fiery stuff. And cups, of course, is, is the heart stuff. That's all the touchy-feely stuff, all the watery stuff, all the stuff that makes us cry. Um, the pip cards, and this is where Pamela Coleman Smith got her um, interpretations and the pictures that she drew, was from the pip cards, and it starts out with the symbology that I just talked about, and then it moves, uh, and then it moves on to the numerology. And when you get the symbology, uh, before you had the pips, before you had the pictures, like in Pamela Coleman Smith you kind of had to know which one of these it was on the Tree of Life. And this is, um, <clears throat> this is the Tree of Life, and, and sometimes it's kind of a map of the Kabbalah. And uh, this is kind of a reflection of the whole magical system that they use for the tarot. Uh, you have three, this right here, Malkuth, that would represent our physical world, the things that we all touch and feel. And then you move up to the next triangle, and the next triangle talks about the things that we can perceive, the things that we can perceive in our minds, uh, the, the soul level stuff. 
Uh, then we, we go to this level, and th this is the stuff that we can imagine. And this is the stuff that's basically beyond our perception. You know, and the idea is that there's, there's a whole big universe out there, even in the mystical level, and we can't understand everything, but we can understand some of it. Um, <clears throat> would you move on to 17, please? Okay, this is, this would be from the top deck, and this is the Ten of Cups, but you notice that the, how it's set up? That is a reflection of the Tree of Life. And here is the pentacles, and that too is a reflection of the tree of life. Um, now, Pamela Coleman Smith, she was, uh, she illustrated children's books. Um, she was right with weight as far as being, showing restraint and, and, um, you know, making the cards inviting and putting it together in a way that people can understand. Uh, Alistair Crowley's deck is a little bit more uh, complex, and it's one that I don't usually use in readings. I have the deck. My son got me the deck, but I find that its energies can be a little bit uncomfortable because it is complex and it hasn't been whitewashed the way the Rider Waite deck, the Smith Waite deck has. Okay, so I wanted to go on, on some of the other comparisons of these two decks and the artwork. And um, you see the, the impact of these geometry from Lady Frida Harris. And uh, this was what, how S Smith and Waite portrayed strength. You know, the, the woman has a, a white gown on and that would be purity. And, and the idea is that because she's in touch with the infinite and because she has this confidence, she can just walk right up to the animal and put her hand in his mouth. Okay, and that's, that's a very, you know, Mother Nature meets the lion and the lion's all tame. And that's a really um, peaceful, serene picture and it gives you a good feeling about strength. And then you can go to Lady Frida Harris and, and uh, th there's a big difference there. Um, she seems to be riding the hounds of hell, and, and uh, I don't know what happened to her clothes, but... <laughs> <laughs> Anyhow, the idea is that, that I can see why the Victorians would have been uncomfortable with this, and I think that both Lady Frida Harris and Alice Crowley did like the shock. And I think there's a little bit of that in the deck, too. Uh, next. And another thing that I'd like to point out is that the numbers are a little bit different between the two of them. And in Smith and Waite's deck, it's the Justice card is key 11, and the Strength card is key 8, and Crowley has turned that around. And that's just kind of his way of being competitive. Um, <clears throat> and in this particular card, the, the picture says that uh, Justice could be a hard master. But it's fair because your heart is weighed against a feather. And I, I know you can't really see it in there, but there is a feather right in there. And the idea is that if, if you haven't done anything wrong, your heart could be weighed as a feather and will balance out. Um, here, it, it's a little bit more um, out of touch, out of reach. It's like the justice stands between the absolute beginning and the absolute end. So it gives it more of a, 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 less of a feeling of fairness and more of a feeling of judgment in a bad way. I, I'm really uncomfortable with that. Um, anyhow, moving on, <clears throat> I wanted to get to my first deck, which was a Rider weight deck. And it was a really a good experience for me to get that first tarot deck. I was 15 years old, and my mom did see something in me. She tried to give me a Ouija board. It was just, it was uncomfortable. But that tarot deck was something else. And I, I wore the book out. And even grade this particular book, um, I think she picked up a lot from Wayne's book. 
and it had uh, it had Pam and Coleman Smith's drawings, just like Wade's book did, and went by every card, bit you know, one by one, in, in her book. But in the back, she had lessons where she talked about reading. She talked about how to approach people. And as I did the readings, uh, you know, more and more readings for myself, I, I started to find that I was drifting away from the divinatory meanings and going to the back of her book, where she has this wonderful glossary of symbology. And it, it's just the more I found out about this, the tarot, the, the more I got drawn into it. And so as I, uh, you know, as I focused more on the symbology, I learned to read the tarot cards intuitively, and eventually I gave up the blank book. But in the back of her book, there were a number of readings that I still use to this day. Of course, she's got the Celtic cross in it. Every deck of cards you buy has a Celtic cross in it. That's kind of a complicated reading. Um, <clears throat> but she also had one that she called the uh, horoscope reading. And that had 12 cards and one in the center. And the idea was that each one of the cards was associated with the house of, of the horoscope and so forth and so on. But there was a little blurb at the end of it that said, well, you can use this for a 12-week cycle. And I started to do that. But then I started to use three cards. And over the years, I developed a 39-card spread that covers a 12-month period. And it has a really complicated... Uh, uh, report that goes with it and everything, but it all started with Eden Gray's book. And that's one that I would suggest you, a good starting point, as well as the uh, the writer Smith Tarot. Now my first deck, I was in high school when I went off to the service. That one just fell by the wayside. And my, my focus changed a little bit. But I went back to the tarot. And uh, uh, this time I used a deck called the Aquarian deck that has some really art, nouveau kind of art to it. And um, I started collecting. It's funny, before I started this, the, the <coughs> before I started the lecture, Bill had said to me as I'm putting out the, the cards, you know, there are some people that collect cards just for the artwork. And I can believe that. And some of the cards have absolutely amazing artwork. These two decks, I think, are the best just because you have 78 cards and every last one of them is sublime. And I don't know if any of you have done a lot of drawing, but just the idea of sitting down and doing 78 drawings in a row and having them all be that nice and that beautiful, it's, that's quite an accomplishment in itself. And not all the art, not all the art and all the decks I've found have, you know, lined up that way. Although there are some that were very good at it, not just the uh, the Smith deck and not just the Toth deck there, but there's also uh, the Robin Wood deck, which I know that you carry in the store, and that's very similar to the Wade deck. Anyhow, um, <clears throat> moving on, I started doing readings for people when I was in the Detroit area. When I came here to Canada, I brought my tarot deck, and I couldn't work. So the first place I went was to the penny saver office, and I put put my hand in the penny saver, and I started doing psychic parties, and I started doing readings, and uh, then I started doing the psychic fairs, and that was just sheer luck that I ended up in the psychic fair. And that's what got me thinking about teaching, because I had a collection of cards. I think at that point in time, my front booth had spread out a few examples of six or seven different decks. And people would go by and go, oh, I have that deck, or I have that deck. And, you know, I'd say, well, okay, so um, there's a shapeshifter deck. That's one of the decks that, uh, that Gloria has down at her store. And, and I'd ask, well, so... How are you enjoying your deck, and how are you relating to your deck? And I found out that most people who have tarot decks, or have, they were at the bottom of a drawer, they didn't know where they were, they are gathering dust somewhere. And I started thinking about the things that uh, make it difficult for people to learn the tarot. And that's how I started my getting into my classes. Because I realized that <coughs> the reason that people have a problem 
relating to the tarot is basically if you read the, the booklet that you get, the baby booklet, and also any blanky books you have, might have if you ever take my class, that's the first thing I'm going to make you throw away is a blanky book. But they give you the, the Celtic cross, and that's a really complicated spread. That's ten cards. When I first started reading back when I was a teenager, I tried to do that Celtic cross. That'd take me 45 minutes, most of it, flipping through the book, card by card by card. And that's a difficult place to start. So um, I developed a class that incorporated some of the things that I had learned along the way about psychic development that I'd learned in some of the psychic development classes that I had taken. And um, I went to the Blue Leaf Bookstore, which is no longer there, but that was in Kitchener. And uh, I, the owner there, they sold the tarot cards, so I convinced him to put a little sign next to where he sold the tarot cards and start the tarot classes. So I. When I started teaching the tarot classes, it was back in a little storeroom in, in a second floor bookstore in, in downtown Kitchener. And uh, eventually I opened my own store called the Mystic Rendezvous. And uh, I did my readings out there, did the uh, radio show. And I taught other classes, but you know, the tarot class was always the best one. You know, and I know that it's not easy to learn. How many people here have a tarot deck? Almost all of you. How many people read it? Half. And, you know, I love teaching, the thing that I love teaching about teaching the tarot class is that first night when you see everybody there, they don't really know each other and everybody's chattering. I'm at the front of the class, and I get to run you through the class and watch everybody form friendships. Because I kind of have you work together as a group. Because, you know, as a group, we're stronger together. And it helps you to learn and bond with your cards a little bit more. So they're, they're lots and lots of fun. Um, <coughs> and when you're choosing a deck, I know some of you have decks, but I know that some of you might like to get into other decks. You know, um, first, if you're going to just be a starter, I would suggest starting out with the, the, the Wade Smith deck. But you know, when you move on beyond that, go with something that has pictures that you can relate to. Because the artwork is everything. And a, a deck that you don't like, somebody else is going to like. In my early classes, I had a deck that um, I would got that was supposed to be attached to the, the, the uh, Golden Dawn or whatever. But it was a favorite deck of um, one of the uh, writers that I was reading at the time. And I tried and tried and tried to attach to that deck, and I just couldn't warm up to it at all. But I brought it to my classes because I wanted everybody to see the different decks. And there was one fellow there that I just couldn't reach. I swear the guy was deaf. But he picked up that deck, and he loved it so much, I just gave it to him right out of the... So, okay, you can have it. So, you know, it's, it really depends on what artwork you like. Because if you like the artist, you're going to look at the picture, and you're going to see something different every time you look at it, no matter how plain that tarot card is. Um, it's... You know, I've, I've had people come up and ask me if it's evil. It's, the tarot is neither good nor evil. It's a tool. It's a pieces of cardboard with ink and plastic coating. You know, it is what you perceive it to be. It's what you bring to the table. Good and evil is a choice that you make. The tarot is just something that's really cool and a lot of neat pictures. <clears throat> Now, if you're not inclined to read and you want to choose a psychic, that's another thing. If you want to choose a psychic, um, choose me. <laughs> no, actually, you know, it helps if you talk to the person. Um...